everybody? Scuffy here. It's been a while. It's been about three weeks, I think, since the last video I did. I've had some, had a lot going on. Uh, had to make some moves. Had to move on very short notice. None of that matters. What matters is I'm back and I'm finally wrapping up today the Imperial Army card by card. And that has been a long-term project. Uh, again, kind of going back to it with, when it comes to the neutrals, the neutrals have got far more cards than your standard faction. So doing a card by card for them takes <laughs> a ridiculous amount of time. In addition to that, I think right at the onset of me doing the uh, Imperial Army card by card, we were just getting into the the, the Terra expansion and we were going to see some new neutrals added. We have seen several new neutrals added. Really quick, I'm going to glaze over them um, because some of them have been lower cost cards. I'm going to hit in this video here cards of cost six and up. And we're going to cover the rest of the Imperial Army uh, section in that regard. Video one, we covered the Imperial Army Warlords as well as <clears throat> cost cards of one and two. And then video two was cost three through five. So we're getting to the tail end of it. But we do have some new Imperial Army cards that we gained through the course of the expansion. Um, so really quick, I want to give up on the Defiant Stand. Um, Decent little one energy card. Gets frontline to a friendly troop. If it's a solar auxilia troop, this is a new faction, new, new sub faction added to the game as a result of the Defenders of Terra expansion. And a lot of Imperial Army units, um, some very interesting ones, got the, the solar auxilia sub tag, kind of like cultists. Um, forward section is one such example of that. They are solar auxilia. They're frontline one three, and for a rally, they gain plus one plus zero for each other friendly solar auxilia in play. Um, we got greatest duty here. This was a release through the event. This is an event reward. Um, your warlord gains battle honor heal one. This isn't bad, especially on mono warlords. Uh, Jagatai Khan makes good use of it, but Ram, Lucius. Uh, guys who can play troops, but also want to be a, doing a little bit of attacking, who have the way to get to three attack, especially, this comes in very handy. Three attack is a, any warlord with three attack, or a warlord who can gain multiple attack, Lehman Russ is a good example, um, are very, are much more likely to dispose of troops when with a single attack, so Grace Duty serves them well. It's not game-breaking. Um, but this can go in also anything with the first strike. Uh, it does decently with the Custodes Warlords, um, whether it's Tarmachian, Nassau, who can kind of first strike. Both these guys have got first strike. Valdor is going to attack and uh, get his whispers off. So if he's healing, that's great. It's a very low cost. It's easy to pull off. The problem is it's a legendary. So if you don't get it, that's not going to do you any good. Or if you get late game, or if you're playing an opponent who doesn't have troops, this card is kind of a dead card. So that is kind of the trade-off. Um, we also saw in the three-cost realm, we saw Katsuhiro. And I am doing this this follow-up after some nerfs that were going to come to the Solar Auxilia. When they came out, they were a little overtuned. Now they are kind of undertuned again. Um, he had much better stats. Now his resolution, same resolution, gives plus one plus two to a front of the unit. Uh, the downside is for this is it's got to be a solar auxiliary troop, and it's a resolution, so it's not immediate. Here's here's the big difference. Katsuhiro on release was a two three, same resolution, a little bit better. Um, the downside is by comparison, you've got a two energy troop. The Secutari Axiarch, same stats, same survivor, right out the gate. Friendly infantry troops have plus one, plus oh. It doesn't even have to be Solar Auxilia. So Cat's a hero by just through the nerf immediately takes a hard hit, um, which is unfortunate because I don't think he really needed it. I don't think, I think he was fine as he was, but Solar Auxilia troops coming out the gate were very hot and very... Uh, damaging to the meta. I won't say damaging. I would think, I think they could really steamroll. 
and they could really get steamrolling. Katsuhiro helped with that, but he wasn't the uh, he wasn't the real problem. Uh, some of the cards got Solar Auxiliary added to them, and I kind of covered this on the uh, on the release video. We got uh, Souls Garrison as a neutral card, which was a decent card on release, giving plus one plus one to your troops with the front line. It gives plus one to plus one to Solar Auxiliary troops. So it's kind of like a uh, a loyalist um, or, or a neutral version of you know cards we've seen before cards that buff in some regard and have two two elements to them um but we also got imperial capital which draws destruction from your deck it costs two less which is kind of the uh the rare version of supply lines for structures makes very good use i'm seeing a lot of people um play this in the Imperial Fist builds, especially, that are making use of those. Um, we also got, in the four cost range, we got some some big stuff. When I say big stuff, we had Lord Castellan coming out swinging. They quickly changed this ability. This is an okay troop. It's not fantastic. It's not really great. Like, your best bet to play four energy to get another Solar Auxiliate troop that costs five or less, you might get a five energy Solar Auxiliate troop. If you're lucky, otherwise you're probably going to get a Vaxillarius, which is a very good card. This is probably still one of the better Solar Auxilia cards now. Resolution lowering the cost of a Solar Auxilia troop in your hand by one. Strategic Reserves, which is a great neutral on release, but they up the cost for it. Four energy just to draw two infantry troops from your deck. And if they're Solar Auxilia, give them plus one, plus oh. Far, far overcosted for what this card does. Um... It was a little bit of a tool, but it wasn't huge. Uh, 45th section, again, solid. This is probably another great Solar Auxilia card. 4-5 or five front line. One damage with a decent ability, but the front line is nice. The attack is good. What's really nice about it is that this card is a Imperial Army with front line, so they can be generated with Ornatov's Barge, as well as that one energy uh, Solar Auxilia troop. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. That, that increases the uh, the range. Ornatov's Barge had a six roll. There was there were six units initially, ranging from Winter Soldier, terrible one two unit, all the way up to the the Ogrens. And now you've got another high roll. Um, doesn't gain higher attack, but at five health and a decent ability, and synergy with the Solar Auxilia. That's not bad at all. Um, and that wraps up the five energy stuff. So we're all caught up. The big game winner of that, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit, but the, one of the reasons why the Solar Auxilia got changed was Marcus Valerius. Um, this is a legendary, so it, on release, ridiculously overpowered uh, legendary. In addition, you could, on release, create him with the uh, Lord Castellan. So for four energy, you get this guy, and he would give Survivor one to all of your Solar Auxiliary troops, which it would include himself. Now that has been changed now. He has a resolution effect, which is a very powerful timing, uh, but it just gives Survivor one to your other Solar Auxiliary troops. So by himself, he's not going to do anything for himself, but he, if you've got several Solar Auxiliary troops in play, then he's going to gain something. He's a good legendary, but he's really shines if you are playing a Solar Auxilia or you've got multiple troops on the board. Otherwise, he's okay. You might be better off with a Merit's Mercenaries or a Helios Mortar Carrier with better effects, uh, better better stat increases that don't require other cards out in play. Merit's can you know gain pumps by you playing cards. Helios Mortar Carrier is just going to do that damage. So... We've got that up now. We've got the 204th cohort. This is a tactic. This is just put two last rifle sections in play and give them frontline. Again, for a quick reminder, last rifle section is the 3-3. Three, three. You won't gain the rally effect, but they are solar auxilia. So that is a way to kind of get some solar auxilia on the board if you're playing something like that. Um they gain frontline, which is nice. So you get two three three front lines. It's nothing fantastic. Um, unless you're playing like a frontline deck or you've got some other ways to make them stronger. But even then, you're talking six energy and six energy, you'll never be able to play these both in the same turn unless you've got multiple 
cost reduction cards like Tactical Brilliance. Asad Kamara, this is a card that is just not worth it. Uh, decent health for 6 energy, at least you're getting 6 health, but it's a 4 attack, and for 1 energy, it actually just adds a random Imperial Army Infantry to your hand. That's it. Now, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I am actually going to say that this is the only, and this is a model, this is a model kit. This is an art. If if you if there's a source art for this image here, that actually isn't a picture of a tabletop model Camara, I would be shocked. Like normally when GW or GW, whenever Guild takes a a model, and they make it into a card, you know they stylize the art a little bit. You actually see that here with the with the uh, with this guys with the forward section. This is actually a, a tabletop model, but they've kind of you know. Patched it up. Uh, Vela Terrace is also uh, a tabletop model that they've kind of added some gleam to. The uh, the alternate art for Gleam and Ross, which just came out last week. But this doesn't look like there's been anything added to it. This looks like an unphotoshopped shot of somebody's Chimera model. So I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, prove me wrong, and I'll, I'll give you a pat on the back. Um, but I don't play with this card. I don't think you should either. Add random Imperial Army Infantry to your hand. Okay, you could get a high cost. You could get a low cost for one energy. You're not attacking with this 4-6 vehicle. And then you still have to play that, that card. So, not so great. Uh, Forced Orberns, these guys are good. Generally, they get better when you play them with an Artos Barge. And they you generate, you high roll and you get like three or four of these guys. That's that's feel-good moment. Um... Otherwise, you are probably going to play these early on in your career when this is a decent rare. It quickly gets outpaced. It's got a decent ability. Whenever your warlord is damaged, whether that's your turn or your opponent's turn, it's going to gain attack. So it can very quickly and very easily um, get to 5 or 6 attack, and you don't have to worry about it getting returned to your hand because of uh, Ambassador Melgator. But as a frontline unit... They are susceptible to cards like Breach. Um, they're nice, but they're not going to win you games. They don't do anything else other than give you a big fat 6 health to kind of buy you some time. Ground Defense is actually not bad in some decks. You get two Bunkers, and again, kind of flashing back, the Bunker is the 1-5. Uh, the so for 6 energy, you're getting 6 energy worth of, of Frontline Material. 1-5, uh, Frontline, that's it. Doesn't do much for you, but if you are playing a certain build and you want that front line, whether it's for a challenge or whether it is just to put out a couple um, buffers to prevent, you know, your warlord from being attacked or your troops that you're trying to protect, that's not bad. It's quickly outshadowed by Ornithos Barge, but Ornithos Barge is a little bit more conditional. At least ground defense, you know what you're getting. Nothing... Uh, is worse than getting two Winter Soldiers with your Ornithos Barge. At least ground defense, you know you're going to get two bunkers. So that's pretty good. Now, long-standing Helios Mortar Carriers possibly, and it's arguably, still one of the best common neutrals in the game. I clarify neutrals because I do think that there are a couple very good common cards within the Legion factions. Um, but this card used to be much higher statted. I think it started out as a 3-8, actually. Um, resolution, deal 3 damage to random enemy. This card has so many things going for it. If you get it out with a uh, you know, turn 4 because of supply lines, that's a powerful card that your opponent has to deal with. It's got 6 health, so it's going to stick around, or it's at least going to require several cards to deal with it, whether it's tactics, damage, flanking, whatever the case may be. The best way that you can get rid of it, aside from a hard removal, is with like a single Vorax. But even then, you have to use both of the Vorax attacks on the Mortar Carrier. And you're guaranteed to at least have taken three damage from your opponent because the turn that they play it, it's going to deal three. Still a very good card. Anytime you're not sure what to have in there, or you're playing with a Warlord who can buff troops, reduce the cost of troops, has anything to do with vehicles, Helios Mortar Carrier is a card to consider. We talked about Marcus Valerius. I only touched on Merit's Mercenaries. 
Emeritus Mercenaries is a really good card. It's a shame that this guy's face is covered up by the six energy. Um, this card really shines in a few decks, specifically like Calvert Hall or decks that can combo multiple cards or can play Reflection. When you play a card, you gain plus one, plus one. It starts out as a four or five. Okay, that's not bad. It's it's susceptible to Ambassador Melgator. But what if we play Escape Vent on it right away? And most decks who play it do. Then it immediately becomes a 5-6 with Stealth. Now, that's just at 6 energy. Now, let's just say you play this on Curve at 6 energy. On your next turn, you now have 7 energy to play multiple cards and make it even stronger. And depending on what you are playing... <coughs> If you are playing, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the 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 Caliber Hall deck, and you're playing Mechandrites on him, those Mechandrites are going to enhance him even further, in addition to his stats. Uh, and then the Merits Mercenaries just can become a beast, right? Now, there's no way for them to gain Ward through that purpose, but if you have other cards such as a Praxis Nebula. Um, or maybe Demon Host or something like that. They can really get out of hand. These guys can be a win condition in of themselves. Um, they're, they're neutral and they fit in a lot of decks. I would prefer a Merit's Mercenaries over Marcus Valerius, as I said, because Marcus Valerius relies on cards on the board. Whereas Merit's Mercenaries, really, the only limitation is cards in hand. If you play Merit's Mercenaries and you don't have any other cards on your following turn to to enhance him further, or you can't protect him via a survivor or a stealth, uh, then you're not going to get the maximum value for it. But then that's kind of the that's kind of the, the game more than the card itself. Now, Mount Pharos, this is still very meme. Um lore-wise, this is a, this is a great story. If you haven't read Pharos, uh Pharos is a book is okay. It's not written fantastically well, but plot-wise, it covers a very interesting um, moment during the the, uh, the campaign in the Unremembered Empire. And uh, going any further from that, basically, it is an artifact that allows for some crazy teleportation. And the Ultramarines, and Robert, Robert Gilliman, uh, Ro Robert Gilliman uses this to kind of supplant the when the Astronomicon goes blank right and they're not able to travel space-wise well he's able to use pharaohs to travel through his through the ultramar sector so thematically this has actually got a really cool ability as a relentless you get a random astartes in your hand and it costs two less basically they're just these astartes showing up out of the portal and this can lead to a lot of crazy combinations a lot of unexpected turn of events because not only are you going to get an astartes that could belong to any faction, have any sort of ability, whether it's poison, frontline, ward, stun, flank, uh, rally effects, whatever it could be. It can be of any rarity, and it also costs two less. That's a very powerful card. This is a really good legendary. The only downside that it has is it has a four attack. That means that it's very susceptible to Ambassador Melgator. It has 9 health. This thing is going to stick around unless your opponent's got a high attack unit already on the board. They either have to use a hard removal to get rid of this, or they have to at least give you one turn with a random Astartes. Now, you could low roll. You could low roll very easily and get something like Rakoth Squad or Abacol Squad. You know, nothing like a good zero energy 2-1 drop pod, not going to do anything for you. But very simply, you could also high roll. I'm just looking at the trader elements here, um, but you know, one of the classic ones is the Raven. You get the Raven and now he costs 7 energy instead of 9, and he's an 8-8 eight, eight fast. Or maybe you get something, you know, kind of kooky and unexpected. You're playing Dark Angels, you've got troop buffs, right? All sorts of troop buffs with the Stardis. And then, lo and behold, you get Archimus who in of himself is giving plus two, plus two to other starters, and he's going to cost three. It's got some really fun potential to it. And anytime uh, you can use it, when you've got a warlord who can protect it, increase its health, reduce its cost, Lucretia makes very good use of it because she can play it at five energy. She can increase its stats, making it, you know, 
uh, higher than the uh, the Milgator range. But right off the bat, if she gets one Astartes that costs two less, with her ability, it costs an additional one less. Now, it's easier to get said to do than sometimes. Sometimes you throw that out there and your opponent's got an answer for it. But it is a very good card. Uh, it's not a legendary that you must buy in the shop. But if you are on the fence where you're like, hey, you know what, I want to try it. It's, it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Or a Tom's Barge. This card gained, like I said, this card gained some value with the release of the new neutrals. It was very nice. Um, but it is a, it is a, uh, it's a random, it's a random element. So I can't say awesome things about it. I've had games where I've gotten a couple Ogrens and I felt really good. But it seems to me personally that I've had more games where nothing I get is Winter Soldier or Grops. And I say Grops, I mean the, uh, no, not these guys, the, the two energy, the three ones. These guys who die to a frag grenade. That's just really sad, you know, or, we, or you think you're like, all right, my opponent's got a full board. I'm going to get a frontline unit first. I'm going to get six frontline units and you get four winter soldiers. And you just shake your head. Now, there is a high chance that you could get four ogrens too. And I've definitely played opponents who've gotten four ogrens. <laughs> There's nothing you can do except for, for like a, a board clear or like an unstoppable, you know, direct damage. Um, but it is a random element. It's, it's not going to win you games. It could buy you games. If you're playing a troop warlord or a warlord who needs a little bit more protection, um, a warlord who can gain something. I've been playing with recently, just this last week for, oh, actually I can say last week, the last couple of days when the, with the new campaign, I was kind of inspired to pick up Maros again and start playing around with him a little bit. Um, he's got that Requiem effect. And he gets plus one, plus, you know, plus oh, plus one to a random friendly unit. So if they clear out my orange house barge, he could heal himself. He could increase the health of the other barge troops. Um, so yeah, it was just an idea. Um, by the same token, by the same token, very easily, barge used to be very good with old uh, Bolvi. Bolvi, who used to be able to buff the board for one energy, um, or 200 for the whole board so like you could barge for eight six units and give them all plus one plus one or tarsa atesh tarsa of the uh the orphans of war you can't you can't exploit them of the same to the same degree anymore so there's not a whole lot going into them but i mean if you roll high roll three or four units with barge and then you give them all survivor one that was a good feel it was not a good feel for your opponent but you know it comes and it goes it's not Again, it's not a card that you must have. It's a card that works in some decks, and there's a card that doesn't go in many, many decks. Um, it's a decent legendary, though. So let's get into the higher cost cards. We're talking about the seven ups now. Archaeology. This card got changed um, as a to a resolution. I actually think it was a fair fair trade. It's two ten. It's very high health. It's susceptible to Melgator. Can attack, but every Every the end of every turn, you're going to get one of your count fish. Now, this used to be at the end of every turn, which included your opponent's turn, which was very problematic because it would give you a troop that you could attack with on your turn because it was created on the other turn, so there was no summoning sickness or delay. Um, that was too fast. That was that was very exploitable. The backlash is still exploitable, but for some decks, that's what you want. Put in play five unsettled populaces. And on some populace, it's just this 1-1. One, one. Zero cost, they don't do a whole lot. But they combo very nicely with cards like Viral Bombs and Perturabo's Whispers. Um, or, you know, they work well for Reckonings, like Sanguinis, um, or Ferris Manus. Archaeology is a decent way to provide you reliable turn after turn of troops. And your opponent can either deal with the 2-2 two -two that got put out, or they can deal with this 210, or they can ignore both, or they can get rid of the 210 and then have to deal with a wave of five one ones. Um, it creates some engagement. It, it, it creates some options in terms of how your opponent has to deal with you, and I like that. It's a good epic. It is a good epic. It's not, in it, again, it's one of these cards, like most neutrals are, they're not gonna go in every deck. 
but it can work very well in some decks that want to use it. Now, Charonite Squad, this is another uh, Solar Auxilia. This is a, a, it's been a long standing card, but it got the Solar Auxilia tag. I like these guys are the upgrade ogres, right? When your warlord is attacked, it gets plus three plus zero in front line. Now, unlike the six energy, which they just gain it when your warlord takes damage, this one your warlord has to be attacked. So direct damage will circumvent it. But sometimes I've had it where the opponent misses the timing and they attack with one unit, and then suddenly Charonite Squad gets in the way and is now an eight seven with front line, and they've got to they've got to figure out how to deal with that. Um, this is a very good card in some decks. Uh, it doesn't go in every deck. And I think generally as time goes on, you tend to like outclass it with other cards. Command Post is a fine example. This is a good structure. And doesn't have frontline. It's got you know, nine health, but for one energy, it can give plus two, plus two, and frontline to another friendly troop. Not to itself, but basically if this thing survives, on the next turn, it's going to start making things bigger statted and with frontline. And then you're not going to be able to deal with a command post. The command post is going to be sending out more and more troops out there. Command posts can steamroll very, very nicely. The problem is with them being a seven energy card with four attack, they can be disposed of. Uh, or at the very least, sometimes you, your opponent is telegraphed. You know that they're going to they are shooting for a high cost card. Is it going to be command post? Is it going to be learning hydra? And you're kind of holding that hard removal for a big drop. So that's a good target. That's a good uh, crack grenade. Uh, deal five damage to it. Melt a bomb can straight up destroy it and deal two damage to adjacent units. Now melt a bomb. Skipping over Melkador and furnish really quickly, but um, this card used to have high value when. It, the game first debuted uh and kind of denied people from playing vehicles and structures at all like in general that was a huge risk like there was no reason they always included one melt -a bomb as the time has gone on uh the game doesn't see these included a whole lot but if you're playing a burn deck um or just kind of a you want to have the basis covered i roll one in my mandrago racks it never lets me down the time late in the game and we have a lot of late game vehicle additions now. Your opponent throws down something. Uh, maybe they throw down the old, I can't say the old, the new. They throw down the new Aquas Astra. They're thinking, ah, I've got you at 9, 10. It's a strong thing. This thing used to have shield. No, I'm going to melt a bomb it and it's gone. Um, it's not, again, it's not an auto include, but it's a decent card. And sometimes people forget that it exists. Um, you know? I don't know. Think about it. Now, Malkador and Furnace. This is another Solar Auxilia. Deals two damage to all enemies for two energy. This is actually a really good stat for what it does. It's got good stats. It's not bad. Um, I think this would be something worth it considering for a Proctor build. The only downside to it really is once you get a card like Doombringer, which costs one energy more, but does the same thing for free, it's a little bit easier to get rid of. It's instead of a you know five seven or a six seven, it's a it's a seven five, um, which means it dies to a crack grenade. Uh, still, you don't have to wait. That's that's a resolution ability versus this. It has to survive, and you have to pay the two energy. So there's a trade off there, and I think that is something that is if you're a newer player or you don't have a full collection, that is a good card for you to an extent. Um, I don't think this is a card that you're going to see play in most decks unless it's like an event and you're drafting it. Um, most ladder builds are gradually going to wean cards off like this. Higher cost cards, good ability, but just there's better options. Ogre and Sergeant. Love the artwork. Always have loved the artwork here. Uh, just looks good. Kings plus one, plus one when your Warlord is damaged. Again, kind of throwing back to the Ogren bodyguard concept here. Um, these guys are not bad. They're not great. Uh, the, these were a, a release card. Time has gone on. And, you know, there's, like, your Warlord can get damaged once on your turn, maybe multiple times on your opponent's turn, um, which could be game ending. And you've got cards like Merit's Mercenaries, which can gain plus one, plus one faster for less so there is a trade-off there now the upside 
the upside is that, you know, the Ogre Insurgent is an Imperial Army Troop, and there are cards that, you know, can create Imperial Army Troops. Or you can give him Frontline and plus 2, plus 0, plus 2, plus 2. Um, but that 7 energy, again, as I said, if you're playing higher cost cards, you have to be prepared for your opponent to get rid of those. Auxiliary Lehman Russ, uh, again, another Solar Auxilia card. We got a lot of cards added here with the Solar Auxilium. Great ability, actually. Uh, very rarely use the ability for 4 energy to deal 4 damage to an enemy troop, but the fact that it can act again, you can use this. At, you play at 8 energy on your next turn, you use its ability twice to deal 8 damage to an enemy troop, and then it can still attack for 7. That is a relentless Lehman Ross. It is actually a really, really good tank. Um, the downside to it is that there are other tanks that have an immediate impact, and generally you, you want to play and follow up with other cards, so you just attack for the 7. But uh, this is a great card in events. If your opponent can't get the can't deal with this late game in events because they've dealt with other stuff, this can win you the game. It's hard to say if this will have the same impact if you're playing uh, ladder play, so keep that in mind. Ah, desperate defense, boy! I could go on for I could do a whole video about desperate defense or what was of desperate defense. I don't need to anymore. This card was a problem. As it is now, it's not a great card. But it needed to be put in the corner. It drew, and that, like, you can agree or disagree with me on that. I still play people who sometimes will throw in a desperate defense. Draw and put in play a random troop from your deck and give it front line. This used to cost 10, and it used to give two troops from your deck and give it front line. The problem with that is that you get to build your deck. So you know what is in your deck. It can be a random troop, but if all your troops are high stat troops, or troops that have shield or survivor, backlash, rally, 10 health, or have a way to you know consistently return, and then they gain frontline. This card quickly got out of hand. Now, if this was a desperate defense, and rather than draw and put in play a random troop from your deck and get a frontline, it did something like Ornithal's Barge, where you just randomly generated a troop or an infantry or a vehicle or whatever it is of eight cost and up and gave it frontline. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad, but that's not what we have. So this card, as it is now, you might say, well, what if I pull out Jubok and I make effort, I spend eight energy to put a three energy troop in play and give it frontline. Well, that's the desperate defense. And again, you are in charge of this card. You build your deck. If you still want to play Desperate Defense, you certainly can. Make sure that when you're building it, you do not include many or any troops of 8 energy or, or under 8 energy because then you're losing value. Learning Hydra. Just a great card. This is just, it's good. The stats are fantastic. 9 8. The rally is always useful. Um, Downside to it is it costs 8 energy, but that's realistic for what it does. It should cost 8. Oh, look! Guys, this is another tabletop model. I just realized that. I was from afar, I always looked kind of like art. This is a tabletop model. Ah, oh, ho oh, oh, I caught your secrets. This is a straight up tabletop model. Mmm, good stuff. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the rally effect here can really, first off, it can protect it from most high cost removals if you play it on curve or if you're able to play it for less energy like imperial empress children can play it with tactical brilliance at six or five energy or less depending on how they've comboed it uh, and then your opponent can't play hard removal without having to have a two extra energy and some of those hard removals are typically around four to five six seven for the really decent ones for the like the factions that you know don't want to face a nine eight tank um, they might not be able to deal with it on that turn. It works really good if you're throwing it down against an opponent who's about to have a tactic combo hand and wants to play three or four tactics in their hand. Suddenly they can't, and their best option is to just play one tactic. So Learning Hydra is a very nice card. Um, if you're looking for a little tactic hate, it's worth including if you've got ways to play troops or to get frontline. I love throwing it in Ornitov at 9 energy. Ornitov can drop the Hydra, give it frontline, and now you've got a 9-8 frontline, and you've made it a little bit harder for your opponent to play tactics on their turn. 
just a great card now. It doesn't do any damage. Doesn't do like the, the rally effect is just solid. So I can't say enough about that. Uh, Shipmaster Kyra is okay. I, it, it's a great ability. You turn an enemy troop to a hand for one energy. That's really good. Uh, if you can get him down and he can stick and your opponent does not have a way to eliminate him, none of their troops that don't have ward will stay on the board. For one energy, get rid of that uh, Dark Mara, put it back in your hand. You may not be attacking for eight, but you are controlling the board state. The downside to that is you kind of want to be attacking for eight. So he's, he's a win more card, right? If you play him down and he survives... You're either going to win because you're attacking for 8, or you're going to win because your opponent isn't going to be able to do anything. But he's got to survive. And as I mentioned with the Command Post and Chair Knight Squad, like, these endgame cards, these are all really powerful cards, but they're all conditional in the fact that if they do, if they survive, if, if they survive, you know, endgame, there's a lot of ways to get rid of it. That's one reason why I like learning a Hydra so much, is because it makes it a little bit harder for your opponent to get rid of it. Emperor's Wrath. Now, the artwork for this is fantastic. The idea for this is very cool. Draw and put in play three Astartes from your deck that cost four or less and give them a draw pot. This is a card that is designed for Astartes, for the Legions. It's not designed to be played with the neutral factions. It's not designed to be played with the you know cards like uh, Mechanicum heavy decks or something that is playing with vehicles or demons or infantry astartes specifically if they cost four or less and then they get drop pot it costs nine energy the downside to it is because it costs nine energy by the time you get to play it you might have played many of your astartes in your deck that cost four or less i haven't really been able to play this effectively with satisfaction. I want to. I really do. I want to be able to drop a bunch of Space Wolves and Drop Pods or Salamanders, Dark Angels. You know, there's a there's a lot of like an, an Imperial Fist. The downside to that too is that when you're playing them and put them for your deck, you lose any sort of rally effects. So your best bets are really just going to be solid static troops, which is why I said Salamanders, you know, like the guys who've got some some abilities, they get a little bit of protection. They've got some survivor. They're not doing anything else for you on that turn, but you're not losing any of the rally effects. Whereas if you're playing this against, uh, you know, let's just say well, like a, 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 the Ultramarines, you're not going to gain their courage, right? You're not going to gain their courage effects. You're not going to gain, um, yeah. Uh, that, I mean, they've, they've got a lot of four-cost guys, but you're not going to gain the Courage Gains Flank. You're just going to put it into play. So your best bet is really just sturdy, stable troops. And again, I just haven't played it to satisfaction. I like the idea for it. I know I've seen people try it. One thing that people have I've seen do, and it gives it a little bit more uh, life, is people play Jewel of Ultramar. And they play that to reduce the cost of all infantry and starters in your deck by one and draw a card. That does work in conjunction with Emperor's Wrath. So if I have five energy troops and I play to Wolchamar, they become four energy troops. They cost four or less. And now they become a target for Emperor's Wrath. It is very combo. It is very uh, end game, and you've got to play only with a handful of warlords who can get to the end game state. I think Vulcan does it decently well. Um, trying to think of someone else who could probably pull it off, survive. Maybe Mortarian um, without Death Guard, though. I, like he doesn't have great Death Guard troops. Like that's the thing. Like, I wouldn't want to put down the Death Guard that costs four or less. It's it's so it's so niche, it's so niche. And if it costs seven, even if it cost eight, maybe I would I would consider it. Nine, it's just it's just eh. Um, Malgor tank doesn't do anything. It's just a seven twelve. That's it. But it does have twelve health. And that is kind of nice. I do play these in my Onatov deck. 
but I also played just about everything that's cost nine up in Ornithoph because it's a challenge build. Um, for 10 energy, I threw down a 12, 12 health front line that my opponent is sad about. But that's it. That's all I do. They don't do much for you. Uh, Zerio Storm. This is okay. This has got a really powerful Relentless if you can manage to stick it. Oh, shit. It's another tabletop model. That is that is a tabletop model. There's no denying that. That's three. That's three. They must have just, like, found a table. and like, you know what? This, is, this looks kind of like the same, like, uh... Same table here with the little snowy thing going on. Hmm? Maybe maybe it wasn't snowy. Maybe it was uh, some siege. Anyways, getting distracted by by the uh, the, the cheap shortcuts here. I'm not going to blame them. I'm not going to fault them. They, they did what they had to do on release for, for set one. Um, but uh, Relentless, deal 10 damage to a random enemy. Now, this can be thwarted very quickly. First off, this troop can attack. So it's just going to deal the 10 damage that way. You're never, unless you jam it, unless you play sabotage on it, you're not going to be able to deal with the seven damage to anything other than things that are attacking it. Um, but if your opponent plays out multiple troops and they can play two or three troops out the gate, they could very easily sidestep this 10 damage. If they don't, that 10 damage is going to go on their warlord, so that's kind of cool. Um, that's the way you play it basically. If you play Zerial Storm, it's Really effective against uh, mono warlords or warlords who don't have troops in hand, or maybe only have one troop and they're going for the 50 50 you know, coin flip. But if they're able to play like Lord Bears late game and they play three or four troops, they water down the chances. And then on top of that, because they're playing three or four troops, they're probably very like low health, like two health or one health troop. And there's nothing more frustrating than watching the Relentless 10 damage go and kill a wounded zealot. So. Keep that in mind. Um, Defense Force. Now, this is this this card. I think we expected a little bit more when it came out, but it's actually still very good for what it does when you want to do it. Uh, this still works in these def desperate defense decks that are still trying to play desperate defense. They're a defense force. So, how about a desperate defense force? Ten energy, but if you can get it for eight, cool, right? It's a six six. That basically will always be backlash put in play when defense force you've got jam it. Um, this isn't conditional. This isn't a conditional put in play like the Death Shroud, right? Um, Death Shroud is the 8 8, and your opponent it, you know, it has backlash. If you don't have any other troops, you get a Death Shroud back. Defense force, man, that's their only job is to defend. So if they die, another defense force comes out and tries to defend. They're 6-6 six, six, as opposed to an 8-8, eight, eight, and they cost two more, and they're neutral. It's okay for a deck that wants to do a very specific thing, but I wouldn't rely on this as an endgame card. For 10 energy, if you want an endgame, you use Orbal Bombardment or Stormhammer. Those are really good endgame options for you if you're trying to use Imperial Army Neutrals for that endgame scenario. Um, but if you have got ways to build around support or get to that long state, Defense Force can become a win condition. I wouldn't include more than one of them in a deck unless you're trying to really, really hard for that desperate defense. So, Hell's Fury, pass. Um, this is basically, Zerial Storm is a hard upgrade to Hell's Fury. Hell's Fury has higher health, has lower attack, but has to pay for to deal 10 to a random enemy. Zero Storm, for one energy less, just does it for free. So when you get to a Zero Storm, you don't even consider a Hell's Fury. Um, not worth it. Pass on. Uh, like I said, Portable Bombardment, this is a this is a neutral finisher. Um, it's a little sticky because sometimes you're not dealing 10 damage to one unit. Uh, if you're playing against a opponent who can throw out multiple units, or blah, 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 but really doesn't become something you can rely on. But basically, it's deal two damage five times for a random enemy. You're getting 10 damage for 10 energy. So, as I said, six energy or 10 energy for a 6-6 six, six attack that, you know, you might be able to do something with versus end game, I pay 10, I deal 10. That's your end game scenario if you must have it. 
Um, I've had games where the 10 doesn't go off because they've got two extra units and it hits the one I don't want it to hit. And I've had many games where when I play over in Bob Barbara, I know that it's going to deal the 10 that I need to hold. So I like that. And the fact is, um, you might say, why two five times? Like that's, yeah, okay. But that also helps pop Survivor. That's really nice because it can, instead of just deal straight 10, it can deal two and two, and then maybe that, that four damage breaks the health of, it, of a Warlord. And then now they go into their Survivor. And then you hit two and two and two more, and you've just dealt six more damage to their Survivor five, and you've been able to kill them that way. So it's not bad. It's, it's, a, it's a decent, like if you, if you are a faction, and there are some factions that don't have a finisher, Salamanders, I'm looking at you, um, that don't have a finisher card. When I say finisher, I'm talking about cards like Vengeful Spirit. You know, the instant tactic that just, like, ends the game. I'm talking about, you know, Emperor, Pride of the Emperor. These sort of, you know, flagships, right? If you are a faction that doesn't have one of those, doesn't have a troop like the Raven that can f come out fast for, for lethal damage, it is worth considering... Orbital Bombardment. Now, you might have other options. You can go into other modes. If you've got troops that are very high and healthy, um, you want to play Stormhammer, you could do that too. Uh, Orbital Bombardment, though, it's not bad. It's still not bad. Uh, Stormhammer. Now, I want to say, this looks if, if this is a tabletop model, it's been photoshopped here around the edges very well. But I think this is this is a... I think this is kind of more akin to the the newer style of photoshopping that Evergill has done, where they take a tabletop model and then they spruce it up a little bit and add over some some uh, some animation filters so it doesn't look like it is actually a tabletop. But this is I'm going on far too long. About ten energy, solar auxilia tank, rally deal three damage. This used to be four. This was a this is a new release solar auxilia, so it was a little over tuned. They dialed it down a little bit. Instead, dials three, but then it just keeps going if it kills that target. So either you're dealing three to the enemy warlord by playing this card, or you're dealing three potentially to every single one of their troops if they all have three health troops, killing them all, and then you have a 712 on the board. There's no drawback to that. Like the worst thing that the worst thing that can happen is you deal three damage to the enemy warlord and don't win the game. Like that's the worst thing that could happen. And, and that's the best thing that could happen is you kill all their stuff and you still deal three damage to the enemy warlord. Either which way, the warlord is going to take three damage. So keep that in mind. Uh, Stormhammer's nice. With the changes, it's better. Um, it's, it's more fair. Uh, you could include one. I don't know if I'd include two. Like I said, if I'm really relying on that for the end game scenario, I might go for the old 10 for 10 versus 10 for 3. But this has the potential to wipe the board, whereas Orbital Bombardment might scatter and kind of rain over the board and not wipe anything out. Uh, Triumph of Bonor. Pass. Don't use this card. Just don't, guys. It's, uh, it's never good. At best, this has been okay in event drafts when you have to draft or you have to play an event deck or something where this is included in other cards. And maybe over the course of the game, you get to play it for like eight or seven. It's not good. If you really want this effect to get plus one, plus one to all your troops in play and in hand, there are factions that can do this with better, um, better methods, right? Why not? I mean, now this isn't going to do anything for your vehicles, but for your starting infantry, sure, you just destroy it. For, as opposed to 10 energy, you can pay it for two. Or how about, you know, how about the uh, little Malkadors? You know, they take that 10 energy card and they're like, you know what, let's just right off the bat, give it to you for six. Like, there are better ways. Don't play that card. Just don't. Right? I'm trying to think if there's anything positive I could say in here. Like, I can't. I can't. It's just not good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. We did it. We got through all of the Imperial Army card. 
all of them from from card six up, um, including a quick recap of the new additions to the Imperial Army faction. Um, the Imperial Army's cards, you know, there are some good, there are some bad, there are some okay stuff. As neutrals, they should be. As neutral cards, they really shouldn't be super outstanding, but they have so many ways to work, whether it's with an Imperial Army Warlord or with, uh, you know, decks that need troops that are maybe special support cards, um, <laughs> cards that, that you can always rely on, uh, or cards that are very, a little bit kind of niche, but at the same time, do something uh, unique for certain decks. So it works really good in Dar, for example. Um, I, when it comes to the three neutral factions, I probably lean a little bit more to the troops of the Mechanicum, just a smidge. But there are always cards in here that I that I rely on. Um, when it comes to Imperial Army, like legendaries, probably three best legendaries for neutrals are in the Imperial Army faction. Kaiserlein, Jubak, and uh, Duke. These guys are just solid cards. These are very good cards uh, for neutrals. And they can go in any deck and they are always going to be reliable. Actually, I take the back. Malculus is number four. So it's so a very, you know, just just a great neutral card. What's not to like about that guy? Um, they're just kind of shoehorns. They, they go with so much. I hope you have fun with them. I hope, I hope you kind of a, maybe agree or at least like got your your thought mind stroked by the video today um i don't know if there's anything i can't say about these cards it's kind of a the high end of the neutral pool they do some powerful stuff but they have limitations too as neutrals should uh standouts standouts for the card six and up i would probably say merits mercenaries helios mortar carrier and learning hydra there are some good runners up but like they're a little bit more niche arcology is a good one um melt -a bomb and and mount pharos i think those are those are good runners up and if you really need to pick up any of them i would say probably learning a hydra is your best bet and it's a rare so yeah yeah all right guys I'm a little rusty. I'm back. Uh, I'm, I'm getting stuff set up and unpacked and uh, hopefully being able to spend a little more time getting some more content back out here. Now that we've wrapped up the Imperial Army card by card before I get into the Mechanicum, which is going to be another three video series, it will be the Night Houses. I have sat on these guys for a whole year and it was worth it. Uh, because I'm finally going to be able to do a card by card where I don't just say every card is bonkers. I can finally, I, I just, I just didn't want to do it. And that's a little bit of a spoiler, but when it came to the Knight's Houses, I really held off on doing the card by card for a while because it's like, what? How do you talk about this faction that nobody wants to play, but at the same time, everybody can recognize how powerful they are. They're not in that same degree. Um, so I'm, Looking forward to doing this as the next card by card. I'm not sure when that will be yet because I really want to try to get some other stuff up. Uh, we've got the uh, podcast. Uh, it's going to be back up. We'll try to podcast when we start to do that again. Um, to get some delays. I want to do you know, new decks. I want to get in there. We, I haven't even really gone on too much. I talked a little bit about on this, the last stream about these achievements I've been working on. Uh, the latter ones is my last my last leg as well as the walking fortress that's going to happen at some point um we're going to get there we're going to get there um otherwise yeah yeah so thanks for tuning in if you like the video please like it so i know uh recommend it to your friends who are starting to play the game and want to know a little bit more about certain cards uh, or just check out the channel let me know if there is anything that you would like to see specifically. I've got a couple requests that I'm going to try to get to. Otherwise, just thanks for checking in. And until uh, next time, keep playing Legions. All right.